Yes, thank you very much. Hi, everybody out there into the world. So it's unfortunate that there's not coffee. Uh, so uh, but I'll get a, a few of the formalities out of the way. So my name is Adam Cuppy. If you didn't read from the program, hear from Jeff or know that. Um, so my name's Adam, and I come from a company called Zeal. We're a consultancy, and more specifically, we sell certainty. Uh, and I'm going to get into a little bit about what that means uh, and trust and the relationship to that. But before we get too far, because there wasn't any coffee, um, can you all stand up for me real quick? Just stand up, stand up. All right, you know, the thing is, is we want to get some blood flowing, right? Like, we got to have the blood flowing. It's come, like, what time is it right now? Oh, start that. I mean, it's like 2 o'clock, so here's what I want you to do. I want you to look around the team, so face each other on your, in your, on your table. Face each other on your table. This is good. You're doing so well. Okay, now what I want you to do is reach your hands out to the right and gently touch the shoulders of the person next to you and give a nice, gentle coffee massage. That's right. You can do it. Don't worry about it. It's a nice, gentle coffee massage. And I want you to gently whisper into the ear of the person next to you, I am your caffeine. Very gently. I am your caffeine. Okay, if you were someone else's caffeine, I want you to say yes. yes. Say yes. yes. Outstanding. You can take a seat. But do it with that caffeinated hand, shoulder, love from the person next to you. So before we get too far, I want to remind you that this is my Twitter handle. You can send all your appreciations to that. I just um, want to remind you, if you need to check the anti-harassment policy, it's on the top of the website. It's like the <laughs> top link up there. If you have any questions about that. Thank you, Jeff, <laughs> for trusting me. All right. So the nature of this talk is about trust. And I know you've heard a lot about that today. So we're going to go a little bit further into a couple of different components, and more specifically, how you can bring trust into a team, which I know you've heard a lot of as well. Now, I have, uh, our organization has a more unique perspective on it because of the type of work we do. Um, while we are software developers, just like all of you, if not most of you, um, while we do the exact same type of work, the nature of how we work is a little different because we work with many teams over the course of a year. In fact, our company might work with a dozen different companies across maybe upwards of 15 to 20 different projects in different stacks and so forth. So trust is a huge part of what we have to provide. And ultimately, the way we think about it is in the form of certainty. That at the end of the day, really the only thing that's worth all the value is the certainty that it's going to happen, right? And it's my belief, and I'm going to show a little bit of evidence, so hopefully you believe with me too, that trust is a big part of that certainty. But how we build that trust is really important. And I'm going to get to this in the end, but spoiler alert, trust is not something that you can guarantee from somebody else. But you can absolutely work to encourage it and foster it. And that's exactly what I'm going to talk about. So this topic of trust is a very unique thing. So I want to tell you a little bit about a, a story about mine. And actually, I've decided to change my story on the fly because Taking the risk and going to Australia and putting a bunch of Americans on stage and saying, hey, I want you to do something from Shakespeare is something that, may, that might make you twinge a little bit. So what I was told before I went there is I got the talk, I got the talk accepted from RubyConf Australia. And I was like, wow, right on. The name of the talk is What If Shakespeare Wrote Ruby, right? And so the nature of the talk is I literally will call four volunteers up on stage and they will do a scene from Romeo and Juliet, blind, right? So I get this whole thing accepted, and an Australian friend of mine reaches out and he goes, that's awesome that you got that talk done. Just so you know, the number one thing Australians hate is being called on stage. And I was like, great. I'll just fly on the other side of the world. This is awesome. Then a few months later, so we did the talk. Jeff was one of my wonderful volunteers. I will gladly post the link to that talk. And more specifically, I'll make sure to put it right to the point where Jeff starts his wonderful verging on soliloquy. Uh, but then the following couple months later, the talk gets accepted again, and this time in Taiwan. And I'm like, okay, wow, so here's the thing. Like, uh, just so you know, like it's, you know, I only speak English, so I want to be really clear. Like, this talk is going to be in English, and I just want to make sure, you know, we're talking about old English specifically and more traditional English, so do you feel that's going to be a concern? And the response was, yeah, we think it's going to be a total concern, but it's going to be a fun thing to watch. And I was like, <laughs> right on. So on the fly, I made a decision. I had trust in one thing. The trust was, is that if I put the intention behind it properly, that whatever the outcome became, it would fulfill the ultimate purpose. And it was to entertain and inform. So I took the biggest risk I could imagine, and I had the entire script that they read translated to Chinese. Okay? I was the only person other than my wife who was lucky enough to fly out there with me 
that had no idea where they were at in the script, right, at all. The beautiful thing was, again, that we took a risk. We trusted in something that we couldn't prove would come out to be true. But what we had is we had the right intentions and the right purpose, and I think it paid off. So that's really what we're going to go into a little bit more about. All right. Now, I want you to take a moment. I just want you to close your eyes. Don't worry, you won't have to violate a code of conduct, apparently. I want you to just close your eyes just for a moment. And I want you to think of a time in which you lost the first bit of trust in your life. Can you remember the time in which you lost the first trust you ever had with anyone else? Okay, now open your eyes for a moment, okay? So the thing is, is I can remember the first time that I lost trust in anybody, <laughs> right? There's all these different moments in which we might lose this modem of trust. But here's the thing is it's not all equal, right? Like whether or not you believe in Santa or if that was a part of your family, I have no comment regarding that, but there are these things in which we build trust, we build expectation, and then oftentimes we're, that's at some level violated. And so what do we do about that, right? Because ultimately it's not something that we want to lose, right? So we kind of work towards that. We work towards creating and maintaining that trust. Now here's something that I discovered, um, unfortunately over time I feel in my life, was this. That I am somebody, oops, excuse me, that is hard to please but easy to disappoint. Raise your hand if you feel like you are hard to please but easy to disappoint. There are more of you out there. Come on. Hard to please and easy to disappoint. Absolutely. Right? This is very commonplace. And I don't think it's necessarily problematic. But what it is, is it's, in, it's an indication of evidence that proves towards other things. What it should provide is the opportunity for us to dig a little deeper and figure out, well, why is that? Right? But regardless of that, I'm going to talk to a little bit of a few different things, right? Which is, first is, is why is it hard to please? Like, why do I feel that way? And the only real conclusion I can come down to is that I'm afraid. Afraid of what? Well, I could come up with a laundry list of reasons, but at the end of the day, it's fear. I'm just afraid. I'm afraid that, this is, that whatever's going to happen on the other side of this is going to define me. I'm afraid that the judgment that's going to get passed back towards me, all of these things are going to apply. And so I don't want to extend too much trust out there, because if I do, if I do, and I fail at something, then I've not only lost that credibility, but I've also lost a sense of my identity and my sense of myself. This is the way I feel about it. Does that resonate for anybody else? Okay. So the reality is, is that failure is a big part of this now. But here's the interesting thing, which is if you really look at it, and I'm just now learning about Stoicism. I don't know a lot about it, but, but some of its core principles that are really attractive to me is, to, is fundamentally to, tr to work very diligently to stay in the present. And trust by nature, and the definition of this as far as being hard to please, its only definition is defined by the past. There is nothing about this that has to do with the present, not at all, nor does trust. Trust has nothing to do with the here and now. It has everything to do with the culmination of events, uh, perceptions, decisions that have been made in the past that culminate to this moment right here. Now, it doesn't mean that that's bad, right? And granted, there's a lot of Stoics that believe that we want to strive away from that, but mostly because it can bring a lot of pain in our life. And like I said before, I'm afraid, I'm fearful. That's just real. Now, the easy to disappoint is similar to that, which is, well, if I'm hard to please and easy to disappoint, it ultimately falls back to, well, if I can be easy to disappoint, if I make this choice that I want to be easy to disappoint, then it makes it easier for me to maintain control. And my ego, to which you were bringing up, which I think is very important, is really the danger. This is why. Because if I'm afraid, my ego is the thing that will be, that will be there to protect me, or so I think. So what I did is I did this a little bit of this um, thought experiment for myself, which was, what if I was to move away from this sort of compliance mode of thinking, right? That the way in which I evaluate trust is based on me complying or having other, or expecting of other people to comply with some sort of arbitrary list that I've defined that maybe they have not accepted. Like, what if I was to take it and just flip it a little bit? What if I became easy to please but hard to disappoint? What would change now? Well, here's what I found, and this was a real thing. I was like, okay, I'm gonna meditate my way through this, and I'm gonna actually think about what if I was to change the way I thought about these two things? Like, what if I chose to be easier to please? What would happen now? Well, here's what I found, is I went from a certainty mindset, the need to find certainty in my life, to a growth mindset. 
that by being easy to please, it meant that I always had a pretty darn low bar. It didn't mean it was, a, it was a negative thing. It just meant that my bar was low enough that I was always excited. I always felt I could learn. I always felt like I could be better, right? And interestingly enough, the beautiful thing is on a team, when I was hard to disappoint, or when I'm hard to disappoint, not that I maintain this 100% of the time, but when I can maintain this as much as possible, then the net effect of it is a sense of autonomy by everybody else. They feel empowered. They're, they feel enabled to be able to think past the hurdles that they might be struggling with in the fear that if they don't comply with my demands, because I am a business owner and I am a leader of a team, and legally speaking, like I, can, I write checks, I, at some level for many people, think I control their future, and that's bullshit that this helps me get past, right? This creates a new sense of dynamic amongst the team. So instead, don't be, be easy to please and really hard to disappoint. So, Let's talk about how we can do that, okay? So <clears throat> I was thinking a little bit about like, what if we had trust stacks? I mean, we've got develop, you know, we have program stacks and technical stacks, but like, what is the difference between the certainty side and the growth side? Like, what, what do those look like in an organization, whether it's a, it could even be a team of one, but a team of one to a team of a thousand, it doesn't really matter. And what I found was this, that Teams that were very result-focused, on the left side, result-focused, were those that uh, were too focused on the past and were found, them way, found their way too easily to an unpredictable future, right? They ended up in a very compliance-oriented mindset, right? Because here's part of the problem, is that what we cannot control ever, and we have to give this up, ultimately, it's tough, but we have to give this up, which is that what we can never control is other people's perceptions, other people's emotions, and other people's outcomes. Now here was the, the last was the one I struggled with even to this day, um, and I've had to work through with Trevor, my partner, as well as other, other people, like trying to really rationalize this, which is, okay, wait a second, so what I'm trying to understand here is if I cannot control the outcome, then what the fuck am I doing this for, right? Like, what do you mean I can't control the outcome at all? Like, um, yeah. So if I'm not result focused, then what do I need to be? I need to be intention focused. That the intentionality behind my actions is true. I can control my intention. I can control the ultimate purpose that we have behind it. But I need to let go of whatever the outcome and the result of that might be. Now. I'll talk a little bit later about what we can do about it because it doesn't mean that we have to give up the idea that we can't produce some great outcome or that you have to just give in to the fact that you'll never get to maybe this hopeful goal that you have, not that. But instead is if I stay in this contribution mindset and I allow myself to be intention focused over result focused, the net effect of that is that I've empowered the team to be able to figure out how to get there. And that we get there is the exciting discovery we're all gonna make. Now the other things that I can control is we can control our effort, right? So by putting the kind of intent, or by putting our focus um, on the right thing, then we can control the things we have control over versus the things we never will have control over. <clears throat> now the second is measuring compliance versus measuring growth. So uh, as a consultancy, we work with a lot of organizations that really struggle with this and they don't realize it. Um, that they have come to a way of operation where what they measure is they measure the compliance of their team. Do you show up on time? Do you never have problems? Do you fall within the boundaries of time off or otherwise? Um, do you do it the way that our whole team has defined you should do it or one person has defined you should do it, right? Um, are you measuring against that versus measuring against, yes, but what's the ultimate purpose? What are, you, are, are you working towards your intention? Are you working towards some sort of, are you evaluating growth as a collective? which I think is what I've heard multiple times amongst the teams is, or amongst, excuse me, the various speakers is, if you're putting your focus back towards measuring the growth of your team, like how have we progressed? How have we settled and simmered? When do we need to spice it up, right? If we're back at that focus, then what we end up with is back to a state of real uh, growth and contribution versus a state of just seeking certainty. This is very simple, and this is why I think Agile is something that's very attractive to me personally, and I think why it comes up often in our industry, which is dogmatic versus pragmatic principles. Um, and again, this I think goes back to compliance over growth, which is focusing more on are you doing it this way or are you doing it for this, in the service of something greater than that, right? 
um, and dogmatic principles just simply illustrating you do it this way and only this way. Now, I find this agile for many companies sort of ironic that they dogmatically follow agile principles, right? Um, I don't know if you have a company like that that, that says, well, you know, we, uh, we pair program 100% of the time, period, end of story. And don't maybe always ask the question or measure, well, as a team, is this most, most and best suited towards us driving towards our intention? Like, is that actually a good thing? Like, are we evaluating that pair programming is a necessity for the reasons that our purpose is bound to do? And then pragmatism in Agile is, is effectively a process, hopefully, that's driving towards the alternative to that, which is to say, well, let's flex around it, but really be focused on what is our outcomes and what is our intentions behind this and building a system that's supportive of that based on the team dynamic that we have and the individuals that are involved. And if you're there, what it actually supports heavily is the idea of culture add being a real asset now. Because if it's a culture fit, what you're ultimately saying is, we need you to comply, right? So to be a, we need a fit because we, we measure compliance, right? We're not measuring growth. But if your organization can say, yeah, like diversity of approach, diversity of personality, type, thought, all of that stuff, like that is, huge for us, it's a huge asset because by measuring growth, we need that. We need that diversity of thinking. We need that, that is a real and legitimate asset that we all know and feel that we're actually striving to have versus uh, striving to avoid to not have as a problem, okay? And the last is, <clears throat> oh, whoops, did I go one too far? Oh, doesn't matter. Uh, I guess I'm missing a slide accidentally. Um, and the last is uh, highly, value, highly values loyalty over highly values contribution. So this kind of goes back to compliance. When an organization is highly value, valuing the loyalty of a person in an organization, oftentimes that's symptomatic to the fact that it's more compliance oriented. <clears throat> and versus what are the contributions that, the te that this individual is making to the team. And I want to be really clear that if you are measuring contributions that ultimately say that everyone has to be contributing in the exact same way, that's just a really fancy, sugar-rich way of saying that we value loyalty, right? Uh, contribution can come in one of a multitude of ways, and it's always an agile thing. It's always pragmatic. So like I was saying before, what we see on the left-hand side is this compliance-oriented mindset. This is, this is certainty-based trust is that we are focused on these things. We're result focused, we're measuring compliance, we're dogmatic about the way we do things, and we highly value loyalty. Whereas on the right side, this is, <clears throat> this is growth focused, right? We're intention focused, we're measuring growth, we're pragmatic, and we're highly valuing contribution. This creates trust in an organization ultimately, right? But here's the thing, and this is what we really ran into is most of the problem as a consultancy that we experience with other teams is they'll use things like, oh, well, we're, you know, we're 60 people, and our team is a little over a dozen. We're like 12, uh, 12 engineers, 15 total people, right? So we're, we're relatively small in comparison to much larger teams, <clears throat> and that can often be used as an argument, like, oh, well, we don't have the same problems as you. Well, totally, we know that, right? So how do we handle that, right? That's the question, how do you handle that? So we're tackling the topic of uncertainty. And here's the key, is the only way to bring value to the right side is if you're making sure that you're measuring and you have a process that creates certainty amidst the uncertainty, right? So the way I like to think about it is that there are so many things that we can never control, right? I was discussing those earlier. We cannot control other people. We cannot control that dynamic. <clears throat> but what we can do is we can create processes that provide the certainty by allowing those individuals that might have this diversity of emotion, diversity of thought, diversity of interest, you name it, to be able to function in a really positive and constructive way towards the whole, right? So that creates a layer of certainty around all of that uncertainty. So the question becomes, how do we do that, right? So <clears throat> here is uh, the most fundamental way in which we tackle this as an organization at Zeal is we talk about things like cycles of feedback. Now, how many of your organizations feel like you do a, a version of Agile somehow, like you think in Agile principles? Raise your hand. <clears throat> Uh, raise your hand if you don't do that. Okay, so everybody does some, some agile flavor in your mind. Okay, cool. All right, so we talk a lot about cycles of feedback. Now in our organization, I, I mentioned just earlier like things like pair programming, like this may be something that your, your company adopts. Well, here's what I found is one of the greatest things to think about, <coughs> excuse me, 
as you are looking at ways to improve or to create a layer of certainty around the uncertainty is the more uncertainty that exists as far as how you achieve, uh, how you fulfill your intentions, how you walk down the path is to shorten the cycles of feedback. The more uncertainty, the shorter the cycles of the feedback should exist. That's a very easy way to look at it. So here's an example. Um, as an organization, a lot of teams that we work with don't pair program. Well, coming on to a new project with a new team, there is a lot of uncertainty. We don't know the domain as well. We, probably, we definitely don't know the code base. We don't, we're not familiar with the team. There's a lot of social dynamics. So what's the very first thing we institute? Can we pair program with your team? That is like the shortest cycle of feedback we can provide, right? Let's shorten that down to as small as we can get it. Now that doesn't work for every team, but for us, we found great success in that, right? Another alternative is, oh, well, let's, do you do a daily standup? Can we institute a daily standup for a period of time, measure our growth with that, see if this is a tool that works for us, and decide whether or not this works? And sometimes, especially on smaller teams, they decide that you know, daily standups in the morning are better than those in the afternoon or at night, or sometimes they do it every other day, or sometimes they, don't, they do it more intermittently. And similarly, like IPMs, iteration planning meetings, if you do them on a weekly basis, uh, we have some clients where we do retrospectives and IPMs every other week versus every week, because that's just, that's the flexibility that needs to exist for this to work. But what we've recognized is that in all of these individual tools, the purpose of it is to address the topic of uncertainty. And, and addressing and figuring out what is the recipe, what's the algorithm of tools that we use and the processes that we can apply and how we apply them and when we apply them to address that threshold of uncertainty that allows the teams on both sides and most definitely product owners that don't have as much of that touch point experience, how can they feel that same certainty as well, right? Um, so, you know, many of those tools we could use, right? Um, now, so an example that I just came up to me recently was you know, I'm getting to the age where I have a lot of more family members, especially older ones that are starting to go into a hospital for various reasons. Ailments are starting to occur. <clears throat> um, and unfortunately, I'm losing family members now as well. And so the topic of how do we deal with that uncertainty has become very relevant to me. And, and I realized this, which was, you know, at a time in which, like I'm thinking about this now with my parents. My parents are roughly in their 60s or so. And my parents are currently in a state where you know, it's like uh, I talk to him once every month or two. I feel kind of like an asshole of a child. Let's be real about it, right? Um, but what I'm realizing is like my uncertainty around that relation, that time with them is becoming higher. And so what am I wanting? What's my instinct to do? It's to talk to them more frequently. It's to shorten those cycles of feedback, right? And th so this is very inherent. This is very natural for us as people is let's tighten this up. Unfortunately, oftentimes we will bind something negative to tightening it up, right? Like, oh, if I'm asking a question, which is a cycle of feedback, right? I'm asking a question to get some information that I'm unsure about, and I want to, I, I'm asking you so you will complete that feedback cycle with me, right? That we, we look at that and devalue that thing and say that that's not important or, you know, there's, there's criticism against it. But actually asking questions is the tightest form of feedback you can get. And so if you look at that also as an asset, it can be a huge thing too. So think about those as various tools. Um, so the ultimate goal is to, again, kind of wrap all of the uncertainty in the process, or uncertainty in the project that we have um, with this kind of layer of certainty that exists, right? And do the best we can to create certainty in the things that we do control versus uh, not trying to create certainty in the things we don't control, right? We can control things like our process, we can control things like our methods and our intentions and the effort we apply, right? We can control those things. So that will create certainty. So here's what I want you to do. In front of you, you probably have a notepad. And what I'd like you to do is I want you to draw this graph on the notepad. Okay, so, so all I want you to do is, yeah, so just make an X. At the top, I want you to write certainty. At the, lo the lower section, I want you to write uncertainty. On the far left, write long cycles of feedback. It was a little bit too much to fit on a slide. Um, on the right-hand side, I want you to do short cycles of feedback. All right, so here's what I want you to do because I have a handful of minutes is what I would like from you is if you could, I want you to take one minute and I'll count you down. If you are on a team, like I know there's a, I think there's a group over here from Touring and I think there's probably some companies, but I want you to take one minute and I want you to write down what are all the things you do as a software developer, either on your team or by yourself, that speak to the topic of cycles of feedback. What do you do? You do things like pair programming. Do you, uh, do you send updates? 
Do you uh, email the client regularly uh, if you're a consultancy like us? Uh, do you have one-on-ones with uh, maybe your CTO or some manager of sorts? What are those things? And I want you to strive to come up with 10 items. Ready? And go. One minute. And while you're doing this, think about like what is the shortest thing, like the shortest cycle of feedback that you have in your company, and what's the longest? Whatever it is, 10 items or more, but strive for 10 if you could. All right, another 10 seconds or so-ish. And again, you don't have to comply with my time. <laughs> yeah, if you wanna keep writing down, please do. All right, here we go. So here's what I want you to do, um, and if you wrote over the top of this, because I wasn't explicit about it, uh, you could flip it over and write this again, but here's what I want you to do, is I want you to take each of the items on your list, and I want you to pinpoint, like uh, an easy thing might be to do like one through 10 if you've got 10 items, and I want you to put uh, the number that represents where on the spectrum th that item is, right? So it brings a lot of certainty, and it's a very short cycle of feedback, versus um, it brings, uh, it still has a, quite a bit of uncertainty, like total uncertainty, but it's a really short cycle of feedback, right? It doesn't create any certainty, but it's really short, or vice versa. Something that is really long, but creates a lot of certainty and so forth. And just put the numbers and kind of scatter plot it over, over the top. So you'll end up with something, whoops, yeah, that looks, you know, this-ish, but with numbers, or however you choose to mark it up is fine. Now there's two ways to evaluate this, um, in my mind, right? And the two ways are this. You can look at items on this. So uh, can somebody tell me, like, uh, somebody give me an example of, uh, let's, doesn't really matter where, somebody give me an example of something that is, that they have in this quadrant up here. So it brings a lot of certainty and it's a short cycle of feedback. Give me an example. One-on-one uh, -on -one with someone more senior than you. How frequently is it, or do you do it? Every two weeks, okay. Uh, so one-on-one -on -one every two weeks with somebody else that's more senior than you. Anyone else? Yes. Code review. How frequently do you do it? Every pull request, which is that daily generally? Okay, so like daily pull requests, code reviews. Okay, what else? One more. Yes, sir. Uh, test suite. Test suite. Uh, and uh, writing some sort of automated tests that are running? Uh, say again? Yeah, feedback, from your feedback from your test suite. And how frequently do those run? Instantaneously. Like, uh, are they done on a, some sort of cycle? Okay, fantastic. All right. So somebody, that's great, thank you very much. Now, how about items that might, does anybody have any items that fall into this category? Really long cycles of feedback and do not generate a lot of certainty. Uh, yes? Uh, QA, testing. QA testing, interesting, absolutely. How frequently are those done for you? Uh, once a month. Once a month, <laughs> right, okay. What else, so QA testing once a month. Anything else? Yes, sir. Uh, roadmap, meetings. roadmap meetings, interesting. How frequently do you do, do, you do a roadmap meeting? <laughs> We've done one <laughs> ish, right? Uh, yes, sir. Yearly reviews. yearly reviews, absolutely. So you do those yearly, right? Exactly. All right. What else? Any others? Yes, sir. Uh, sorry, one more time. Customer user acceptance testing. Excellent. Okay. Now let's jump over to over here. Something that is a short cycle of feedback yet does not generate a lot of certainty. Yes. Stand-up meetings, interesting, okay. Um, and you do them how frequently? Monday, Monday Wednesday, Friday stand-up meetings. And you do, always do them in the morning? Always in the morning, okay. Anything else? Something that does not bring a lot of certainty but has a relatively short cycle of feedback? Slack, absolutely. And more specifically, explain it just to me, like uh, give me an example, like uh, a shared room, one-on-one -on -one communication. A project room, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Doesn't bring a lot of certainty, yet short cycle of feedback, absolutely. Okay, so the golden ticket, how about this quadrant up here? So long cycles of feedback, but generate a lot of certainty. Huh? Product a product launch, absolutely. So the actual launch of something, it may happen once every so often, but you got a lot of certainty that the thing happened at that point, right? Absolutely, yes sir. Documentation, Documentation. very good, right? So long cycles of feedback brings a lot of certainty. For Hopefully, <laughs> right? Yes? Postmortems, post absolutely. How frequently postmortems? Weekly, weekly postmortems, okay. Anybody do postmortems less than weekly, so less frequently than weekly? Every other, Every other week? Okay. Uh, any other items? Anything, any other area on here? Did anybody have maybe an oddly placed item like right here? Yes? 
Okay, Trello cards right in the middle, and explain that to me. Why so? That's fantastic. I didn't even, I never even thought about that. So she's saying a Trello card where somebody wrote it months ago and it's now being utilized, right? That's fantastic, really great. Say again? And you put a smack dab in the middle. That's fantastic, I love that, that's great. Uh, yes? Hiring? Oh, interesting, yeah, hiring. So, uh, well, I know the answer to this, but <laughs> how frequently? <laughs> He's my business partner. <laughs> right. Yes. Absolutely. Great. Okay, so the idea here behind this exercise, and I recommend that you take this as simple as it is, it's something that can easily be done with any grouping of your team, because it's kind of, the, the answers to it are relatively indifferent. But what it can do is it can inform you on things like, you know what, like the way in which we currently handle it, while it's a short cycle of feedback that we think is bringing value, the reality is it's not creating any certainty for us, right? So can we do something with that, right? that takes it and moves it from a place of uncertainty and makes it more certain. Can we apply anything? Can we, what do we have control over that allows us to be able to move that to something else? Um, just one share, does anybody have an idea on something that is like down here in this uncertain space that would be an easy modification, would take it and push it up here? Anything come to mind? So basically, is there something that you're, uh, you wrote down in this area down here, so this kind of uncertain space, short or long cycle of feedback, but with a simple modification, you could turn it into something that creates certainty? Yes? Performance reviews. Performance reviews. Speak to that. Yeah, so as at, at our company, we're experimenting a lot with this because we, we found that the combination of one-on-ones allowed for us to have that tighter cycle of feedback. But at the time, we assumed that clearly we need to have an annual review because that's what everybody apparently does. And what we found was, wow, that actually didn't bring a lot of certainty to anything, right? That if we were doing the one-on-ones well, we could actually draw, or we could, uh, we could apply more of that, more priority to that and possibly even drop the annual review altogether because it didn't actually bring enough certainty to the equation and in fact created a lot of uncertainty because it's like, oh, am I now gonna hear something annually that I hopefully would have heard over the last 52 weeks, right? Stuff like that. Okay, great. All right, moving on and finishing this up. So trust is something that you can encourage in your company but you can't guarantee all the time as, as far as getting it from other people. So it's important to remember that it is something to, is to remember the things that you do have control over. What are the things that you have the tangible effect on versus the things that you don't? And if you create a process, that, the last one being a simple example, where you're identifying what things are creating certainty, the net effect of that is the creation of trust. Trust breeds certainty, certainty breeds trust, right? That's the, that's the key important takeaway from all of this, right? And when you're looking at working on a team or in an organization, this is the stuff that is not about hierarchy, rarely is it about authority and management. A lot of these things can actually be introduced in a really micro scale if you just say, well, this is a thing that we do have control over, and if we always embrace the thing we have control over, well, we can modify that. We own that, right? And you'll be amazed, especially seeing it from the standpoint of watching other teams go through this process, like, it will be amazed at how many shoulders drop. Like, the sense and need that you have to comply starts to really start to melt away. I mean, many times it'll rear its, ugly, rear its ugly hood because ego is a very real thing. But at the same time, it's like letting that kind of fall and like relying on the process that's more objective to kind of drive that can be really, really helpful. Now, if you have any questions whatsoever, please feel free to email me. Uh, hello at codingzeal.com. Again, we sell certainty. This is what we do. So if you have any needs, a company that you're working with, it's like, hey, I've got some questions about things we're doing, please feel free to email me. Email me. I'd be more than happy to talk through that. But thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>